Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Binance Podcast. My name is Wee Jo. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Binance. So what I want to do with this show is to spend time talking to specialists, entrepreneurs, scholars, influencers, basically leading people from a variety of industries. Hopefully through these conversations, we can share insights on how blockchain is changing not just these different industries, but also in changing the world. Here's a quick disclaimer. All opinions expressed by our host and our guests on this podcast are merely their own opinions. They do not imply any endorsements or opinions of their companies. You should not take these opinions as specific investment advice, as you will be solely responsible for your own investment. Today, I'm actually joined by a uh, very, very special guest, actually a very close colleague of mine, Yele Badamasi, who is director with Binance Labs. He is uh, Binance Labs' first hire in Africa. He's based in Lagos, Nigeria, but like all Binanceans, he travels around the world and looking for opportunities and proselytizing the, 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 the use case of, of blockchain. Thanks for joining the podcast, Yele. Thanks for having me, Ray. It's good to be here. Your background and your, not just sort of your professional background, but I think your personal background is super, super interesting. And you're our first guest officially from Africa, other than Helen. Oh, nice. But, you know, Helen has done a lot of work in Africa. You're our first guest from the continent. And I think Mm -hmm. um, one of the key things that I think blockchain, but just sort of general startup investing is mm-hmm. that a lot of people see that as the next big internet adoption, blockchain adoption, mm-hmm. and the continent as a whole. Over <laughs> 2 billion people coming on, and over 50% of them are basically ages of 20 and below, and they're native mobile. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity. So we'd love to hear about first your personal background, and then we can jump a little bit, the work that you've done, and then all of the cool things that you've done since you've been at Binance for less than six months. Sounds good. My personal background is quite interesting. <laughs> I studied medicine in university for about three years before opting out to focus on sort of technology and entrepreneurship. It was, you know, at the time, there weren't that many people in in, in Africa doing tech and it wasn't quite clear what was going to happen. But I think I was quite passionate about technology, about startups and, you know, some of the activity that was happening on the continent and decided to move back. And before moving back, I'd taught myself how to program, um, how to code applications and, you know, design stuff. And I'd helped start a company with a friend. We built like apps and websites for non-technical people. In 2015, I was like, man, it looks like there's a lot of activity happening in Africa and I would love to be back. Where were you at that point? In the US? I was in the UK. I went to King's College London and I was studying medicine there for about three years. Did you grow up in the UK or did you grow up mostly in Nigeria? I grew up in Nigeria. I was in Nigeria until I was 14 or 15. And then I moved to the UK, did A-levels and did my university, the first three years of university there. Uh, So I was there for about quite a long time, um, about over six years before moving back to Nigeria. And what was that experience like? Obviously, you're on your way to be a physician as many young, smart people are, as I was. um, (laughs) Really? I switched switched majors halfway through college. Yeah, I was was pre-med. Wow. For about a year and a half, and then I, I got a really bad grade in biology that I was like, oh, I'll never get into good med school. So I switched to economics. Um, that's a good idea. Medicine is, uh, <laughs> is not as interesting as tech or blockchain, definitely. Mm-hmm. For a lot of friends and family, it was kind of like a, they didn't get the decision. But for me, like, I felt like it was the right thing to do. I'd never really felt like I could practice medicine as a profession. And I'd always been very keen on figuring out ways to accelerate Africa's economic development. Um, And I felt like technology was like that enabler, that thing that could really drive change and solve, you Mm -hmm. know, very large systemic problems. So it just felt right. It felt like the right thing to do. And I just had enough belief in myself and to know that I would figure stuff out. What was moving back to Nigeria like at that point? Did you come back with the team or did you go back and then build your team back? (laughs) When I moved back, I knew no one in tech in Nigeria. Um, but like the ecosystem was like super welcome and there was, you know, this amount of activity actually had a couple of offers um, from a couple of startups to join like the product team, but nothing didn't feel like the right fit. So it was kind of just thinking about and saying, okay, what are the problems in the market that exist? And I was fortunate enough to connect with um, a guy called Dotum, who's a well-known VC um, in the ecosystem in Africa. And we started this company called Stata, which is like an online platform and resource community for African entrepreneurs or people who are trying to start startups. 
So we scaled out to about 28,000 entrepreneurs mm-hmm. from across Africa. And that got acquired in about six, mm-hmm. six, about six, seven months. So it was a really, really interesting experience mm-hmm. to sort of build that network, learn more about the ecosystem and figure out what are the problems and the challenges. And that was when I realized that actually one of the biggest problems in the ecosystem was a lack of capital, right? So there wasn't a lot of investors mm-hmm investing in early stage tech companies. And we also realized that these companies didn't need a lot of money to get started, right? So in the US or in mm-hmm. Southeast Asia, maybe you need between 50 to 100K. You know, in the US, it can be anything from 300 to 1 million. But in Africa, it was like $15,000, $20,000. And so, you know, it was kind of figuring out and saying, what can be done in this space? How do you create something that solves this problem? And that was how microtraction became a thing. You know, so I can I can also go into that as well. And what did you do after the first startup goes was bought? So the next thing we did was a company called Microtraction. So one of the uh-huh. ways people describe Microtraction is is a startup that funds startups. And primarily, okay. it was literally saying we're going to put up an open application online, and anyone from across Africa could apply for funding all year round. So we had sort of like a fixed check, fifteen thousand dollars. Um, you just answered about 10 questions. We did a phone screen. And if we like the idea, we'll cut you a check. And we were sort of like the first one to do something like that on the continent. So what was popular before microtraction was like incubation programs or accelerator programs that are very similar to YC. For my experience mm-hmm. for the last year and a half that I've been on the continent, I felt that model was wrong. I felt that, for instance, it's very hard to go to any market. So Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, and find sort of 50 angel investors that have written between 15 to 25K into a single company. So trying to do a demo mm-hmm. day in Africa is like really, really hard. So we were like, we don't want to do a demo day. Also, sometimes you don't have enough companies that you want to fund in a batch. And so you want to end up funding eight mm-hmm. companies, but maybe only two or three of them are really, really strong. So for us, we are like, we're going to simplify that model, Mm -hmm. you know, keep the same fixed check size so we're not negotiating on terms, but keep it open so that anyone, anytime can apply for funding, regardless whether you know us or not, and just make it more open. So that's sort of like what we did differently. That geographical diversity is probably Mm -hmm. something that people in the West or people in Asia don't quite get. Maybe people in Asia Mm -hmm. understand it in terms of Mm -hmm. sort of the divergent different economies in Southeast Asia. But I just feel like the continent is huge. It's got all these people, but yeah. West Africa, East Africa, North Africa, South Africa, those are all very different different and diverse regions. Definitely. And I think so one of the ways our labs was actually trying to explain how to think about Africa, right? Africa, you can divide mm-hmm. it into two different or two, three ways. The first way is to think about it as North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So North mm-hmm. Africa is very, quite similar to the Middle East, while Sub-Saharan Africa is a little, has more cultural homogeneity, you know, like, so music, culture, art, um, diversity is is very similar. There's also Anglophone and Francophone Africa, you know, regions or countries or markets that speak English, like Nigeria, Ghana, or Kenya are all Anglophone countries. And you have Francophone countries like Congo that speak French. And that comes from, you know, the colonial history wherein, like, England Mm -hmm. colonized a bunch of countries. Um, but for Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa, for these countries, I would assume the mainstream mm-hmm. language then is English. Yes, definitely. It's English. That would make communication actually much more frictionless than physical travel. Yes. Yes, exactly. This. It's really interesting to see how the power of the internet has actually made these countries a lot closer. The average African millennial is a lot more connected to each other than like our parents. You know, when I tell my extended family that I'm traveling to Kenya or like Uganda or, you know, or Rwanda, they were usually confused, like, who do you know there? Why are you going there? Is Back then, it was easier to go <laughs> to, like, Europe than to go to, like, neighboring African countries. So it shows you how, like, the internet breaking down barriers and creating more and more unified markets. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you saw the need in terms of, like, the check sizes are much smaller. And then so mm-hmm. the opportunity, I would say, shots on goal are much greater. But from the talk of it, it's like they have an angel community in these in the region and Kenya and Nigeria. Are there any active Western or Asian funds that invest yeah. or have a presence there? Because I know yeah. you mentioned YC, but I've come across projects in Africa mm-hmm. that came out of YC. But are there any Western funds or more international yeah. funds? There's actually a distant number. I think like over the last three to four years, there's definitely been a lot of investment from the US and then Asia is there picking up as well. 
Um, YC, like you mentioned, is probably one of the most active investors. But like social capital, for instance, has done a couple of deals on the continent. Mm -hmm. There are lots of like family offices, some funds like 4DX. And they're like funds where we're sort of starting up in the US that are focused on Africa, like lateral capital. And from Asia, like the guys actually mm -hmm. in the, the, the investment landscape are the companies, right? So one of the investments that we did, a company called Paystack, actually raised money from Tencent. And I know Transient Holdings as well has been doing more and more stuff on the continent and looking to invest in African startups. Mm -hmm. Jack Ma was in Kenya last year and it started sort of like mm -hmm. an e-founders program for African entrepreneurs. And a couple mm -hmm. of the companies we've invested in also got into that program as well. So one of the companies, I mean, speaking of Tencent, I know their biggest investor and their longest investor is a company called Naspert, right? Naspert, yeah, yeah. Which is MIH. I think they're a South African-based multimedia company. Just holding a Tencent, you know, they have a ton of money to invest. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Like, I think that's probably one of the biggest investments of all, like, successful investments of all time in anywhere like especially in africa right like they invested early into tencent and you know there was a time when the value of their holdings in tencent was more valuable than the than naspers itself it shows you how mm -hmm. how these things can play out if you're if you yeah right. i mean the same case was that uh i don't know if you remember when yahoo you know's biggest value was their investment holding in alibaba wall street wow. valued yahoo's traditional business at, at nil and then they value Nothing. all of Yahoo as their investment holdings in Alibaba. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, yeah. but, but I think I do see a lot of, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Me, me based in Asia, I see a lot of Chinese companies that are actually mm. setting up uh, investing corporate money. There's a lot of, I think, a lot of Chinese companies that's actually going in there to building the infrastructure. When Binance was setting up our operation in Uganda mm -hmm. and we did a poll, top college graduates where they want to work, mm -hmm. number one is mm -hmm. Google and number two is Huawei. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's pretty <laughs> interesting. That's an eye-opener, cool. at least for me, to realize <laughs> sort of the, the impact. Yeah. What did you do then after micro-traction? Because that sounds like a really, really cool... It solves the entrepreneur's needs and it, and it and allows sort of like the democratization of investing. Micro-traction is still ongoing. It's still going on like very, very strongly. I've been fortunate enough to sort of like onboard a couple of partners that have helped to continue to execute that vision. And it's pretty cool to see what, what you can achieve in a, in a space of two years. And so I think like how I got into crypto is, you know, happened pretty much around the same time as I started thinking about starting micro traction, primarily because I've been looking at a lot of stuff in fintech, you know, investing a lot of financial services companies and payment platforms. And you just realize that actually, like there's actually a limitation in with the current status quo blockchain creates sort of a new opportunity to create a whole new economic or financial infrastructure and my personal viewpoint on crypto and blockchain is that we're just getting started we haven't even begun mm -hmm. to unleash sort of like utility or the true potential of crypto or blockchain and my first investment was in a company called bycoins they got into yc and i think they're the first african crypto company in y combinator from there, it was just like a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I learned about Binance like most people, and I was just impressed by the execution and sort of just the quality of stuff that was coming out compared to everything else. And I was drawn to the company. So my Binance story, which I don't think I've told you yet, Ray, was that I was in the U.S. So I was in the U.S. in the summer of last year, so 2018. And 2018. I would love to meet anyone in crypto. I got introduced to Christy. And we're talking about like Africa, we're talking about sort of like crypto, talking about Binance. Christy, like if I was Binance and I was Binance Labs, this is what I would do. And I went into this whole sort of, you know, just explain sort of like the impact that Binance could have in, in, in Africa and why Africa was the right place. And Christy was just like, wow, Yeli, I think you should join Binance. I was like, I only think about this. <laughs> like I didn't go into that conversation or even thinking about like joining Binance or like, you know, anything, but... I thought about it and I was like, man, like, I genuinely feel like Binance is a once in a generation company. Um, and I've learned so much over the last, you know, six to eight months I've been here. I really felt that, yes, I'm having, for a lot of people, they didn't sort of understand, like, you know, micro traction is going so well, you know, like, why are you joining Binance? And for me, I was like, I felt like I could have tremendous impact working with Binance and working within Binance. And, you know, you can create so much more leverage and impact. I think like from looking at the company, I could tell that there was a lot of freedom, it was focused on execution, focused on sort of the mission, and it felt right. I'm very happy to say like that mm -hmm. wasn't the wrong choice. Obviously, we're really, really excited to have you with us. 
And going into the work that you guys have been doing for Binance Labs, I know I understand you guys did uh, an incubation program, right, with the mm-hmm. batch of mm-hmm. companies from Africa. Can you talk a little bit about mm-hmm. that program and the, and the progress so far? Yeah, we just concluded season two. So the second uh, cycle for the Binance Labs incubation program. And so we funded 13 companies. And actually, five of those companies came from Africa, right? So we had two from Nigeria, one from Kenya and the Bahamas, and then one from Ghana, and then one from South Africa. So I was super excited by the high percentage that came from the continent. Um, And that shows you sort of like that latency and that demand for capital to go into blockchain projects or, you know, crypto companies. But primarily, it was very similar to any, any other incubation program. But the key difference was that we actually held it in two parts. So the first part, the first seven weeks, was in Lagos, Nigeria. And the last three weeks, we did it in San Francisco with the rest of the other um, batch mates. So we flew the, the founders then to San Francisco with the, yeah, exactly. uh, with the other yeah. batch. Oh, exactly. that's really cool. So we ran three simultaneous batches. Um, one was in San Francisco. Um, one was in Berlin. And then one was in Lagos. And then so mm-hmm. we did all for the first seven weeks, you know, each one was running separately. Although we did like some bunch of calls and things that sort of connected the teams together. And in the last three weeks, leading up to demo day was done in San Francisco. And so it was a super interesting program. I loved every, every minute of it. The guys from Africa, in my opinion, just like amazing. So tell us about some of the projects or some of the companies that, that were funded and some of the founders behind it. Yeah. I'll go through all of them. One of the companies we funded was a company called Bitsika. And in my opinion, I believe that they were the first and maybe the only USSD crypto wallet in the world. And why this is important is that USSD is the protocol or the technology that powers mobile money. More than 60% of smartphones, so 60% of phones in Africa still use feature phones. So these are phones without access to the internet, Mm -hmm. right? So mobile money is is huge and is a big deal because you can send money digitally using a very cheap phone. So when we talk about crypto and, you know, the impact of crypto, the truth is that if you can only use crypto if you have a laptop or a smartphone, then it still means those who need it the most are still excluded from this technology. And so Bitsika basically mm-hmm. just makes the crypto economy accessible to people who have um, feature phones or very basic phones. So that's sort of like what that company is solving for. Then we found a company called Zend that basically figured out how to use the blockchain to enable micropayments. If someone sends, you know, an equivalent of, let's say, 10 or 20 cents and your bank or your telco charges that individual almost 20, 30 percent in fees because the amount is mm-hmm. so small, that makes people not want to use digital mm-hmm. services. So Zen basically allows you to make almost fee-less micropayments using blockchain. They're doing, well, in my opinion, a very important problem. Another company we funded was called Yellow Card. And they allow individuals to go from cash to crypto. Only about 30% mm. of people have bank accounts and most people still hold their money in, in cash. So we have to yeah. figure out and say, how do you get people to be involved or participate in this new financial um, paradigm? They don't need to open a bank account. They can just go from cash into crypto. And that's what the company is trying to solve for. Um, another company that we funded is called Raise. And they are basically building a securities and capital management software in blockchain. So for the rest of the mm-hmm. world, you know, there was a time when STOs were looking like they're going to be a thing, um, but then people realized there was a you know mm-hmm. lots of regulatory challenges. But in Africa, there's definitely a lot more openness to this, and Ray's basically trying to build that sort of like um, layer zero infrastructure to allow um, companies mm-hmm. issue their their equities on the blockchain and then allow those equities to be tradable between sort of accredited investors. And then the last company is called Fishfort, um, based out of South Africa, yep. and they build a Chrome extension that allows or prevents you from falling to phishing attacks. So this is sort of like the companies okay. that we funded. Super exciting, guys. These are sound like very sophisticated technology companies then. These are legit blockchain enabling companies. Exactly. We have thought about a bunch of these companies. I think about them as sort of layer zero you know, the economic infrastructure that I believe we built on the blockchain, right? So it's how do you enable access? How do you solve infrastructural problems that then allow other developers or other companies, or other projects to then build on top of some of those things that you're doing? They're all very interesting companies solving very hard problems, but 
I think looking at the ecosystem of Binance and some of the things that we're looking to do over the next couple of months, they're all very sort of mm -hmm. like synergistic with, with our viewpoints. And we're super excited to see how they operate yeah. over the next couple of months. Yeah. Were they able to, coming out of the, the incubation then, were they, I obviously think these are really cool projects that once mm -hmm. they have a prototype and get traction from both the user perspective, mm -hmm. uh, we should definitely help to promote them to get their next round then. Yeah, that would be awesome. They'll, love, they'll definitely love that. I'm gonna, definitely going to give a shout out for these companies uh, nice. on the pod. So, so if any listeners, if you want to interest, get at the ground zero in terms of investing into sort of like early stage blockchain companies in Africa. We have five like selected targets that came out of Binance Labs' incubation program with all working product prototypes and then gain, gaining traction on the ground. And you mentioned that one was in South Africa uh, and the rest are in Nigeria? Yes, one is in South Africa, one is based Kenya, one is based Ghana. And then two are in Nigeria. So, where did you find these entrepreneurs? Then did they find us, or did you find them through your personal network, or is it like the power of the Binance brand? There, I think it's a combination. A lot of people in crypto know Binance. Probably gonna be following Suzy just because Suzy is such an awesome crypto influencer and Twitter user, as well as just sort of personal networks and speaking to. The first thing I did at, you know, after Binance was just having conversations with people in the ecosystem. I probably did maybe about hundred of these calls. I don't know how many companies, maybe like 70 to 80 companies. Lots of them were exchanges um, or like wallets. So just was the best guys that I felt that, you know, these are people that I would have backed at MicroTraction. Mm -hmm. We know that with the Binance network, you know, we could increase the odds of them being successful. So it was sort of like a combination of, of multiple factors. Season 3 is out. Applications are out right now. So we're trying to do this again. Building a blockchain project on or for Africa, definitely apply and be a part of the Binance ecosystem. As we come in, because I know you're working on something stealth right now, <laughs> and then on a new project that you're building, uh -huh. building in Nigeria, I would like to focus a little bit on Nigeria specifically. Probably one of the lesser known, but definitely for my education, it's the most populous country in Africa. Most people are more familiar with South Africa or Kenya because they're more popular tourism destinations. Mm -hmm. But I do think, I know of Nigeria because there's a lot of famous athletes playing <laughs> basketball and playing uh, a lot football and playing uh, you know, American football and, uh, and European soccer. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of famous Nigerians. If you listen to Malcolm Gladwell, there's a He's, podcast that he uh -huh. did that's basically saying that some of the world's best athletes all came out of Nigeria, including like many in, in the NBA now. Tell us a little bit about Ni Nigeria unique position where it is today people can just know because i think it's really okay. cool all right one of the first facts that you say about nigeria that people are like whoa it's kind of like just the size right so nigeria has yeah. about 200 million people by 20 i think 2050 will be like a top either top three or top four most populous countries in the world and so it's growing like as a very incredible uh, pace from a population also there's lagos where i stay is probably the densest sort of city in the world, right? Lagos is probably as small as, as New York, but has about like 21 million people. It's a highly dense, very, very active country. Or, and what is very interesting about Nigeria as well is that culturally in Africa, it's very dominant, right? So when you look at things like art, um, when you look at music, when you look at movies, so if I talk about it in social media terms, it's an influencer country. It definitely is an influencer country, right? The way I explain is like how China has lots of influence in Southeast Asia and the mm -hmm. U.S. has like in the Western world. Nigeria is like that. So for instance, Beyonce just did an album for Lion King and they, she created an album mm -hmm. that is like Africa inspired. She featured mm -hmm. a bunch of African artists and I think like almost 70 or 80% of them were, were Nigerian. Culturally, huh. it's very, very dominant. We have a movie industry called Nollywood. So it's like Hollywood above an N. <laughs> I think we produce like, like we produce the most movies out of any other industries in the world. And they produce these movies cents on the dollar, right? It's just like dominant in all the fields. And economically as well, it's the largest economy in, in Nigeria. Um, one in five Africans are Nigerian as well. So that just creates sort of like a hotbed of cultural and economic influence mm -hmm. on the continent and then the diaspora as well. So mm -hmm. Africans that live outside of the continent, maybe like one in three of them will be Nigerian. So that's can why. You, can you tell us a little bit about the startup scene then? Because I think you talked about Africa as a whole, but is South Africa leading Nigeria? Because I know Kenya yeah. gets a lot of press, but 
Where does yeah. Nigeria sit in terms of the startup scene now? Is it the next big thing? I think by investment amount, it's mm-hmm. either so, so venture capital raised is either one like either first or second. Okay. Probably second. I think South Africa is just ahead. Mm-hmm. But from a growth perspective, it's definitely one of the fastest growing growing ones. And I think what is what is unique about the Nigerian ecosystem is that it's quite grassroots or like indigenous based. So you have like lots of companies backed by initially local angels, as well as founded by like people who grew up in Nigeria, um, which is sort of like fairly unique from a startup perspective. And then the developer ecosystem in Nigeria is like crazy. And I tweeted something a while back um, when the CEO of GitHub came to Nigeria. He said that Mm -hmm. developers from Nigeria on GitHub have been the fastest growing consistently for the last three to four years. So you have capital, you have talent, you have success stories. And Della raised $160 million. Companies like Flutterwave that, are, mm-hmm. that allow you process payments in about 33 plus African countries, raising money from MasterCard and raised in total about $50 million. Paystack, another one. You know, so you have sort of like very, very interesting companies. You have exits. Jumia just listed on the on the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, I saw it's that. Just, which another one is, is going to be valued that's over about $2 billion dollars. He's also preparing for a listing. So it's a young but very vibrant ecosystem. And something that you'll notice as well is like the average age of the any ecosystem participants is quite young. So like I'm 28 and we should get them to list on Binance then. <laughs> yeah. I mean that'll be really that's, cool, that's, right? That's really, they have growth left, right? Because yes. they're, they're so early, there's so much growth left. I'm excited. I can't wait to go visit. I don't know if I told you, but yeah, like couldn't travel as much the last few months because my wife just gave birth. We just have twin daughters. Woo! But um, what's the best uh, season to go? Uh, so I would say not now because <laughs> it's raining crazily at night. Like when it rains in Nigeria, it's crazy. <laughs> but I think maybe late August, September would be a great time. I've been saying it for a while. We'd uh-huh. definitely love to organize like a binding strip, maybe like two or three countries. You, you can't get Africa until you visit, right? And you just understand how uh, vibrant absolutely. it is and, yeah. and, and sort of like how big the potential for this ecosystem and this economy can be. You should definitely organize, definitely organize the Binance trip. And I promise you it will be one of your, one of the best things you'll have done in the last couple of years. I'll bring other people as well. Definitely. This is all we have time for. So yeah, like, thank you very much for your time. Although we've known each other, we've been working together for quite a bit of time. This has been, it's like, I learn something new every time I talk to you. So this is like extremely educational. Good luck with your stuff project as well. Thanks, Wei. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as, as much as I did. If you like this show, please share this episode on Twitter, Facebook, Telegram, WeChat, or any other social media platforms. Please don't forget to subscribe to the Binance podcast and see you next time.